Thank you all for being here. This is a tremendous turnout. We know that there's a lot going on at this time of the semester, and there's a lot going on on campus all today. And um, as the airlines say, thank you for flying with us today, and thank you for flying to Haiti with us today. I'd like to thank several individuals, and um, I would be remiss if I missed thanking the committee that pulled this together. For those of you who are in the audience, would you just stand up? And I want to thank the, come on. I want to thank the committee for pulling this together. Thank you, thank you. I also would like to thank the Cavanoke Theater for opening up this beautiful space for our access today. How many of you have never been in this theater before? Mm-hmm. Welcome. And hopefully it won't be the last and be here often. I also would like to thank the college for supporting this, for showing that these kinds of initiatives can take root and should be taking flight. And maybe Duval College, after we hear from our speaker, Duval College would be the first to use this model of education for international and humanitarian interests. So I have the distinct pleasure and opportunity to introduce our president, Dr. Lori Clemo, and she's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and um, welcome. I know Dr. Pichter mentioned that there was a lot going on on campus and um, a lot today in particular. So I just want to say within the last 45 minutes, some of the most exciting things have happened to me since I've been here in January, since January. Um, about 30 minutes ago, I was over at the um, Campus Activities Building and there was a big fair going on, environmental fair that our students have organized, the first green fair. So our students are over there saving the climate. Then I was uh, brought back over here, upstairs to our veterans lounge, and had an opportunity to sit with a 102 year old POW who shared his beautiful story with me, and um, we're celebrating his story upstairs, which is remarkable, and our Veterans Association, our students, uh, brought him to campus to be able to spend a lunch and, and share his story with the campus. So uh, through his efforts and through his uh, commitment, uh, he saved, um, actually preserved our freedoms, right? And now today I have an opportunity to introduce our speaker, um, uh, Ginger Oliver, Dr. Ginger Oliver, who will be helping all of you participate in saving people's lives, right, and making people's lives better. So that's within 45 minutes I've been able to experience. So um, I think I have probably the best job in the world to be able to experience all of that in such a short period of time. But that's a snapshot of um, things that happen all the time here on Duval campus, right? That's what our college is all about. It's all about thinking beyond ourselves and thinking um, what we can do for other people. So um, I want to welcome all of you to today's event. I want to particularly thank Dr. Sarah Pichter for the invitation to welcome you to today's event on the Haiti Rehab Project. I also want to thank um, the physical therapy department and the OT department that came together to make this possible, as well as the committee that organized logistics and all the marketing and advertisement that went out. I was kidding with our um, associate vice president for enrollment management a few uh, minutes ago that my husband kept getting these emails and emails and emails about this uh, event. And he said to me, what are you doing today? I said, I'm going to the Haiti Project. He said, oh yeah, I've gotten about 100 emails on that. So um, he's not here today, but he knows all about it. So um, I really have been waiting for weeks and weeks uh, for this event since Father Pirelli told me about this and what was happening and gave me the backstory uh, to how all of this has developed. I'm very intrigued about knowing more about the details, learning more about uh, Haiti and what Dr. Um, uh, 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 Oliver has done in Haiti. I'm also very interested in knowing about what the role of the college will be going forward. I hope it's a very deep role. I hope we'll be able to develop a partnership that will be sustained. Um, Dr. Pichter mentioned that we want to be the first. Yes, we want to be the first at doing this. We also want to be the best at doing this. 
We want to make a commitment that our students and our faculty, our administrators, and staff here at the college will take on this with earnest and, and committing to everything that we can to improve the lives of the people that you will be working with. That means committing our knowledge, our skills, um, and our heart into this project. Um, I must say that over the course of my personal lifetime, I've had a great fortune to travel to many parts of the world. Uh, I've probably seen some of the most beautiful places in the world. I've also, um, sadly, seen some um, very devastating places in the world, some places that have faced great disaster, people that have been in very desperate situations. And while I have not traveled to Haiti, um, nor have I ever personally experienced a devastating earthquake like the one that Haiti faced in 2010. Um, I have, sadly, far too many times witnessed unrelenting poverty, injustice, and despair, like the, the despair that people in Haiti are now facing, or have faced, um, that has been really um, horrible, has been saddening to me, and at times felt spiritually crushing. Some people in such situations, seeing such situations, however, don't look at it as saddening. They don't see it as crushing. They see it as a promise for a better future and a better quality of life. Today's speaker, Dr. Ginger Oliver, is one such individual. In 2012, when Haiti was still reco recovering from this horrific earthquake, Dr. Oliver went on a medical mission trip to Haiti where she discovered the massive healthcare and rehabilitation needs of many were left unmet. When Dr. Ginger saw what Dr. Ginger saw during her time in Haiti, were communities ravaged by natural disaster and poverty, yet filled with hope and courage and much promise. She was inspired to create an organization which she named the Haiti Rehab Project. And her goal was to make lives better for Haitians. As executive director of the Haiti Rehab, she helps to rehabilitate the people of Haiti through medical programs, physical therapy, and providing basic supplies to clinics, families, and orphanages. Dr. Haiti has worked both on the ground in Haiti and here in the US assisting the development of rehabilitation programs and continues to coordinate equipment donation and medication mission trips. Dr. Oliver received her Bachelor of Science degree from Springfield College in 1991 and a Master's of Physical Therapy from the University of Miami in 1993. She received her doctorate in physical therapy from Utica College in 2008 and is currently pursuing a Master's of Healthcare Administration. That's a lot of degrees. <laughs> Dr. Oliver is the manager of the Long-Term Care Rehabilitation Services Department at the Mohawk Valley Health Systems in Utica, New York. She has been a member of the American Physical Therapy Association since 1992 and is a member of the Global Health Special Interest Group. The message of giving selfishly of one's time to give and expect nothing in return, give to those who have less, who are less fortunate to care, to care for the lives of others is in the fabric of Duville College. The work of Dr. Oliver and the Haiti Rehab Project should speak to everyone in this room, all of you who have Duville College values. Dr. Oliver, you represent for the people of Haiti a promising future and a better quality of life. As a college, that's what we are all about, promising future and improving lives. I speak for the entire college community when I say we are delighted that you have chosen Duville to be a partner to help humanity in such a caring way. 
Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Ginger Oliver. I'm just floored by the response I've seen here today. This is incredible. I am so honored to be here and grateful for all you have done even to date to um, support our mission and um, just consider where you may or may not want to get involved. Um, I want to especially thank um, Lori for having me here today and um, allowing me to um, have this opportunity to speak to speak to you. Um, thank you, Sarah, so much for your support and your guidance so far in how we may work together um, to hopefully increase the success that we can have in Haiti. And please thank you so much to the committee who has spent a lot of time already and um, definitely have demonstrated commitment to furthering our efforts in Haiti. So thank you. I, I can't tell you how, how happy I am. What I usually do, or what I'd like to do today is um, tell you a little bit about the background of Haiti so you have a little bit of a perspective of um, what we're talking about and what they've gone through. And then I can um, go into a little bit about my story. And from there, um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about our um, progress to date and our goals for the future. And hopefully after that, we can just have some open discussion about um, how Duville may want to proceed from here and um, see what we can accomplish. Does that sound okay? All right. So this is a map um, that shows exactly where Haiti is. If you look, um, Haiti is right here. And um, many people think that Haiti, or like Africa, um, would be across the, across the world. It would be a 20-hour flight, overnight flight, a really difficult place to get to. But the reality is that that is not true at all. Um, Haiti is right below the tip of Florida. Uh, it's about a 90-minute flight from Miami. Um, and even from New York City, it's a four-hour flight. So it is not that far away. And um, I consider them our neighbor. And um, that helps us to have some um, feeling of how that we can, we can really make a difference for these people. This is a closer map of Haiti. And it shows um, it's a C-shaped island. It shares. The island with um, the island of Hispaniola with the Dominican Republic. So many of us go to the Dominican Republic and many of the other countries in the area to the all-inclusive resorts and um, beautiful, lush, gorgeous Caribbean areas. And Haiti does have some of those areas as well. But um, the history of Haiti is that um, due to their lack of resources, they have really depended on coal for their cooking and heat when they need it. So they have, um, through the years, cut down all their trees to make coal so that they can eat. And what this has done is it really degraded the entire um, environment in Haiti. And um, it's very barren. Um, there's some beautiful lush areas that are growing back, but um, a lot of the areas, the mountains, are very barren. And um, what happens when you don't have trees and, um, and things growing, that when the, when the um, hurricanes come and heavy rains, it causes severe mudslides and um, very dangerous situations. So um, that's been a, a major problem in Haiti. And then the topsoil is also taken off of the ground, and so it's very difficult to grow things. So that's one of their problems. Um, they're also right in the hurricane belt. So they have, I mean, yeah, the hurricane belt. So they've had many hurricanes that come through. Um, they have had earthquakes, multiple earthquakes. Um, whole cities have flooded, so they've been underwater for a few, um, for weeks at a time. Um, so they've had these incredible um, natural disasters. They also have political instability. Um, Haiti, um, I'm not sure if any, many people know this, but it was um, also discovered by Christopher Columbus. And it became a French colony who heavily imported slaves. And so there was, um, a, there was more slaves than French. <laughs> and um, what was amazing was Haiti was the first country where the slaves were able to revolt and successfully take over the country, and they became an independent nation. 
So they are fiercely patriotic, and they do not want um, to be taken over by another country. They have this amazing love of country and um, rich history. Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of corrupt politics, and um, so there are few that are benefiting, and many who are very poor um, and not um, benefiting from the government. So that's been a constant battle for people in Haiti. Some facts about Haiti is that of our Western Hemisphere, Haiti is the poorest country. So in our area, this is the country that um, has the most need. 80% of the population lives under the poverty line. 54 of that 80% are in abject or extreme poverty. They live on less than $2 a day, so think about um, the cup of coffee that you buy on your way in in the morning. So that is um, what they spend for, for the entire day to live. Half of the population cannot read or write, and more than two-thirds of the people in the country do not have a, um, a formal job. So um, part of the problem with building stability in the country is without the formal job, people don't pay taxes, the government doesn't get income from the people, they can't build roads, they can't, you know, all those things that we sort of, our system takes for granted. And um, some of the things that used to bother me a lot about um, the United States paying taxes and um, all those kind of things, um, now I understand why those pro programs and projects are so important. And the reality is that families in Haiti often have to choose between food and education. So we have public education and they do not. So they have, um, they have to pay for their children even to go to elementary school. So if you don't have enough money to feed your family and send them to school, you're gonna feed your family and that um, becomes the priority. So then we get to healthcare in Haiti, and you can imagine that without the support of the government and um, programming, that um, the, the programs in Haiti are minimal for um, educating people to become doctors and therapists and uh, physician assistants and dietitians and social workers, all that. There just isn't the education structure in Haiti for that. Um, there were 25 physicians and 11 nurses per 100,000 population. So think about your access to care if that is the amount of healthcare professionals. Most rural areas have no access at all to healthcare. They may have to travel two or three hours by donkey or by um, moto bike, <laughs> pay someone on a little moped to take you to a healthcare facility. And um, therefore, things that become common for us to be able to treat, they, they're not treated and the um, death rate uh, you know, is much higher. A single health clinic can serve a population of 70,000 people. The average lifespan, which we can understand um, based on the availability of healthcare is about 60 years. And this is rating about 181st out of 190 countries in the world. One in 10 children die before reaching age five. Prenatal um, vitamins um, and, and prenatal care is a problem. Many die, um, mothers and children die in childbirth. Um, and then just um, for other reasons that you can imagine, that's why the, the life expectancy of even younger children is, is less. Malnutrition is a huge problem. 50% of the people are food insecure, which means they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And 50% of Haitians are, malnutrition, mal, are undersized due to malnutrition. 40% of the population is under the age of 14, so it's a very young country. Um, we try to bring our Western medicine culture into Haiti, and sometimes that just really isn't effective or appropriate. Um, if someone has high blood pressure, what do we do? We prescribe blood pressure medications. Um, if they go to the doctor, they have high blood pressure, they, the, they might be able to pay for 30 days of that blood pressure medicine, but what happens after that 30 days? If they stop the blood pressure medicine, then um, the blood pressure may rise even higher, putting them at risk for even something worse. So chronic um, diseases are really uncontrolled in Haiti. And we talked a little bit about Western culture, so 
just um, self-sustaining healthcare solutions need to think um, about what would be appropriate in Haiti. Needs to be inexpensive, easily available, readily acceptable, and um, delivered by local caregivers. So we have to, we also have to take into consideration the culture in Haiti and what would be an appro appropriate and acceptable care in Haiti when we come up with some solutions. Um, this is just, um, when I came back from my first trip, especially um, from Haiti, I, I just all of a sudden thought about all these programs we have here in the United States, and we just, are, we, uh, we're just, um, we're um, grateful that we have them, but sometimes we take it for granted, right? Um, in Haiti, there's no Medicare, so there's no kind of way to take care of the elders. Uh, Medicaid, the poor no social security, no food stamps, no public education, no HEAP, no short and long-term disability, no Americans with Disability Act. I couldn't believe this. Um, just looking at the areas, um, you know, we take it for granted that uh, roads have the little um, ramps so that uh, sidewalks have the ramps so people can get up with a wheelchair and steps. You have to have a ramp or an elevator to enter a public building. There's rules that we have in place here that just are not, um, not in place in Haiti, even if they put the rule in place, they don't have the resources or ability to enforce them or even put them in place. Um, no unemployment, no water available. So um, even obtaining water on a daily basis becomes your challenge for the day. No garbage pickup, so there's um, the public services aren't there, so um, if you see a lot of garbage in these countries, that's because there's just nowhere for it all to go. And again, like road maintenance. So if you think of, if you're um, a person that's had a spinal cord injury and you're in Haiti, um, to get even down the road, um, so to, even to leave your home becomes almost an impossible challenge. So there, here's some pictures of Haiti before the earthquake. It was uh, looks a lot like other Caribbean countries, um, bright, colorful. Um, most of the uh, uh, buildings are one or two stories, so no, no skyscrapers or anything like that. These are the tap-tap buses. This is the form of Haitian tram uh, public transportation. They're called tap-taps because you jump on board and you tap the person when you want to get off. You pay your dollar or, or Food, whatever, whatever the cost is, and then you um, tap to get off. Again, not accessible if you're in a wheelchair or use a walker or a cane or have a prosthetic leg. Street vendors. This is the main, um, remember we said that they uh, don't have formal jobs. This is pretty much the market. Um, you could buy anything that you need um, from these street vendors. Sometimes the vendors sleep overnight right by their cart, um, by their stand, because there's nowhere, you know, someone would take your things or... Um... And then there's, um, this was more of an urban area in Haiti, so Port-au-Prince, Gonaïve, some of the other bigger cities, but um, there's many, many rural areas, and this would be a scene that you would see. Um, carrying water jugs. The children's job is to get walk to the well and get the water and bring it back to the family. And then there's beautiful areas. So it is a Caribbean country. There are waterfalls, um, you know, beautiful areas. And it's a shame that they haven't been able to tap into tourism to really help their um, country grow and become sustainable. And this is, um, the reality was that Haiti, even before the earthquake, was extremely poor. Um, they, they build these um, cement, you know, one-room homes and um, up on the hillsides and countryside. So this is, this is before the earthquake. And then, um, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. That then on January 12, 2010, so we've had all these problems before this. And then on January 12, 2010, a, um, I think it's a magnitude seven earthquake, so a huge, huge earthquake hit 15 miles um, west of Port-au-Prince, which was the main capital, which is the main capital of Haiti. And um, the estimate is 230,000 people died, but the record keeping of people in Haiti is uh, very minimal. So the, the reality is that we think that many, many more people died than this and uh, one million lost their homes. So that picture that showed you those um, one-room homes up on this hillside, what happened was they all collapsed down onto each other. 
and Haiti became the largest refugee camp in the world. There were 400,000 orphans prior to the quake and significantly more after. What I've learned is that um, at the time of the day that the earthquake hit, many of the mothers were inside cooking dinner and the children were outside playing. So um, many of the deaths were mothers and fathers, but um, mostly that was the job of the mother to um, make the meal. This was the president pal presidential palace pre before the earthquake and after the earthquake. So not only did the government building collapse, but all of the government structures, um, paperwork, everything was gone, computers, um, every, every area of the government was affected. This was downtown Port-au-Prince, so if you can imagine those one or two store buildings just collapsing down um, on each other. The cement um, also has um, more, more water in it, so it's, it's a little less, um, less stable than our cement blocks might be. So um, unfortunately, many people were stuck under the rubble for many days. Um, This is a picture of a nursing home, um, outside of a nursing home that had collapsed, so they brought some of the residents outside, um, but then the people had to leave, and so they were really just left on the outside of their building like that. So what they started to do was build little makeshift homes out of anything. There were afraid, any buildings that were still standing, they were afraid to go into them because they were after tremors and um, they really just were too afraid to go inside. Um, they started to build little um, tent homes and then these homes grew. This was Gross Morn and population of 5,000 people living in this tent community. And then here's one, 20,000 people living in this tent community. And we love to go camping, right? But imagine living in a tent for years. So this is Project MediShare, and this was the um, non-for-profit organization that I um, went down on my first trip to Haiti, but they were involved with Haiti prior to the earthquake, um, working with their healthcare programs, and um, so they're out of Miami, um, and they immediately after the earthquake, they started mobilizing medical teams to get down to Haiti, and they put up these tent hospitals right in Port-au-Prince, right at the airport, so they got, pretty much got off the plane um, and built these tent hospitals. This is surgery in a cargo container, because remember all of the, the hospitals had um, been destroyed as well. So they remained in that tent hospital for quite a while. By June of 2010, they were able to move um, to renovate the hospital Bernard Mev, which is a um, hospital that was in Port-au-Prince prior to the earthquake. They, they kind of took over the hospital, cleaned it up, and um, this was the first and only critical care hospital um, for more than 10 million people of Haiti. So after the earthquake, it was determined that roughly um, mo most every single person in Haiti knew people or multiple people that died. Um, one third of the country's population was directly affected. And um, what's happening as time goes on, the Red Cross, the immediate uh, response organizations that you know go to, to tsunamis and earthquakes and they go all around the world, um, they have time frames. And after a certain amount of time, they are required to pull out of the area because then it's become more of the long-term need. So this is kind of where it was at when I first started going to Haiti. And especially the disabled. So now all these injuries occurred. They saved as many lives as they could, but they didn't have any uh, programs or services in place for the, the follow-up care, all the continued care that somebody with a spinal cord injury or a amputation or um, you know even a child uh, with cerebral palsy that was born be you know due to a difficult labor that the mother wasn't able to have good care for. So fast forward two years from the earthquake, um, in my living room reading a magazine, and there was this article written by an occupational therapist, um, about an occupational therapist, and what she did was collected durable medical equipment that was being thrown out, 
and she worked with some shipping companies and was able to donate um, equipment to underdeveloped nations. And I thought that was really cool, you know. I worked in a hospital system. We threw stuff all out all the time. Um, Joint Commission, Department of Health, they, they, we really have strict regulations. If, if an item is torn, we're not allowed to use it for infection control reasons. If, um, you know, something has a little bit of rust on it or, uh, you know, there's something um, that, doesn't make it up to our standards, we, we were just throwing all this stuff out. And so um, what I, my husband, allowed me to use this garage stall that I have at our house, and we, um, we started collecting equipment. He didn't want to give up that garage stall. And it's still full of equipment. But um, so I started with that, and then um, I just was on the website, on the, on the, on the, internet and I decided well let me see what else we can do this is this is kind of neat and um, I called project I went on the APTA website I found that they recommended for mission trips um, this project MetaShare out of University of Miami where I went to school so I felt pretty comfortable that it was an organization that I was could trust and um, so I called just to get a little information and they said well when do you want to go we have room two weeks from now or three weeks from now. And so I had no idea. I didn't know. Um, you know, I had vacation time that I was going to lose. If I didn't use it up, we, we get to carry it over to the next year, but you only have it till a certain date. Um, so I had to use it up. My kids were in sports and busy, so that wasn't a barrier. Uh, my mom lived with me at the time, but um, she was in Arizona visiting my brother, so I could not think of one reason not to go. I had no idea that this one week would really change my life. So this is me flying into Haiti, 2010, I mean 2012. And my first um, look at the area of Haiti was the crazy traffic, you know, up going on the sidewalk, wrong side of the road, four lanes across, you know, it, really no rules at all. Some of you have mentioned that you've been in Haiti before and, or, or other um, Caribbean countries. I think it's similar driving. <laughs> But um, these tap taps were there, and what I found out later is they don't even stop for people with disabilities. So there really is no way for um, somebody who uses a cane, a walker, has a prosthetic leg, especially a wheelchair, no way for them to get around Haiti. So even two years later, there was still rubble in the streets. This was outside the hospital. And then inside, so this was the hospital that I volunteered at for the first week. Um, it was Hospital Bernard Mev. Project MetaShare was working through this hospital. And um, as you could see, it's all outside, single rooms um, around the hospital. Um, right here, this is the triage. So as you can see, there's three steps to enter to um, the triage, the, the emergency room. So um, if you were ill or bleeding or had a fracture or w a reason why you couldn't get up those steps, you couldn't even access what was in the triage unit. So they had to come out and assess you right out here. So our orientation went something like this. You are um, not allowed to order medications, only um, Tylenol or Advil um, for fractures or surgeries because um, Tylenol and Advil is not available to the general population. So it's highly effective and that's all, you know, all they have. Narcotics where uh, physicians were not allowed to order narcotics. Um, you had to make sure that what you were ordering the person that they were going to be able to follow up with it afterwards, such as blood pressure medicine or insulin, things like that. We talked about that. So luckily at this hospital, they did have a CT machine. However, it broke six months earlier and they didn't have the funds to fix it. So this was uh, one of only three C um, CT machines in the country. We were able to order tests, um, lab tests. The doctors were able to order lab tests or x-rays, but only once. Um, and they, the main concept that we were told was if it looks like a duck and acts like a duck, treat it like a duck. You have to use your clinical skills. You can't depend on testing. We don't have the funding to, to do that. So this is the triage unit, emergency room. Med surge was um, 16 bed, so 16 beds servicing 10 million people. 
um, train the trainer approach. So our goal was to train the Haitian staff that they did have, mentor them, train them. The goal was to eventually have the hospital run by um, all Haitian staff. And I believe at this point there's very min minimal volunteer staff still going to this hospital. It really has transitioned to Haitian staff, which is amazing. Um, some crazy things that um, you would see in, in the hospital is how to get blood. So there was a, someone wrote it out on a piece of paper. You have to tell the family, go down here, beg them to take your blood, process it, and then you bring it back. And hopefully your family member is still alive when you get back here. So um, there really was an opportunity for blood bank um, supplies. Um, there was many external fixators. I couldn't understand why are there so many people with external fixators and amputations, but the, the reality is that there wasn't the opportunity for surgery. Um, if you didn't have a surgeon and you had a hip fracture, you, you couldn't have surgery, so they would use external fixators to stabilize the fractures as best they could. And amputations, the same idea. Um, if we have a wound, we can take care of it. It usually heals up. Um, but if you don't have antibiotics and you don't have wound care and you're living in an environment where dirt and dust are easily get into it, your wound can become infected, leading to the necessity to have an amputation. So in Haiti, there are a lot more people that have amputations. And we talked about this. Oxygen. You know, just thoughts that went through my in my mind. No dialysis in Haiti. Oxygen is very minimal if you were in the hospital, but that was it. So no follow-up oxygen after you left. Sterile fields were only used if the um, equipment was if the if hand sanitizer, if the sterile um, dressings were available. Um, we had to bring our own gloves and hand sanitizers because it wasn't available. Um, in this hospital, they had a spinal cord injury unit, and this is um, Carly. She's an OT from Miami, and she met Andre when he was in the tent hospital right after the earthquake. Here he was two years later still at Hospital Bernard Mev because there was nowhere for him to go. They had a pediatric unit. This was the pharmacy. And um, the University of Miami, um, Project MediShare worked together and they created this prosthetic and orthotic lab. Oddly enough, it was on the second floor, so you had to hop up there <laughs> with your amputated leg and um, you would be fitted for your prosthesis, you would put it on, and you would be told, <laughs> walk down the stairs and go. No rehab. So these two I met on my first week in Haiti, and I'm sorry, that's the back of uh, Wilfred Messina here on the left. Um, these two guys are Haitian heroes, um, no doubt. They have an amazing um, vision for people with disabilities in Haiti, and they, they both have dedicated their lives to improving um, the care and the follow-up and the um, quality of life of people with disabilities in Haiti. Uh, Masina on the left here, he is an amputee himself from the earthquake. He was under the rubble for, I believe, seven days before he was able to get out. He had a fractured leg, um, some wounds, um, but because of the infection that um, came up, he, he wound up having to have his um, leg amputated above, above the knee. And, um, he hopped back up the next day, and um, a month later, he was give, give, given the um, uh, temporary prosthesis. He got up, walked out the door, and um, started actually running in the same day that he got his prosthesis. So they thought this was, oh my god, this is incredible. And he had this personality that is just amazing. And um, he now was trained to make uh, prosthetics and orthotics because prior to the earthquake, he was a welder, so he had some of the skills. And um, so Project MediShare um, sponsored his education to learn to get training. And then Sidhu, 
over here, Fortalis also has an um, amazing story. He was two hours away from the earthquake, but um, knew he could speak English. So he decided he really needed to get to Port-au-Prince to see what he could do to help. And he went to the tent hospital and became a translator for the physicians and staff working in the hospital, participated in surgeries um, with the follow-up care. And so they identified him as someone who had a lot of skills and a lot of potential and they um, paid for his education to become a rehab technician. So um, these two, um, I was lucky enough to go with them to meet up with Team Zarian. So Team Zarian is um, made up of men and women who um, most received, um, became amputees from the earthquake, but not all others from different accidents or injuries. Um, and they uh, created this amputee soccer team with a vision of um, bringing back the quality of life to these people because they felt so lost. Um, the, the stigma in, the, in Haiti, for if you have a disability, was worse prior to the earthquake, but still continued. Um, you were called a half man or half woman. You were disowned by your family. Um, you know, husbands would leave their wives. Um, awful, awful things. So they really felt useless and alone and um, down. And this um, soccer team gave them hope and gave them life and gave them people they could talk to. And um, what they wanted to do was create this, spread this vision throughout Haiti that um, you know there's still hope after having a disability. Creole is the um, Zarian is the Creole word for tarantula. And um, very fitting because it's um, a spider that is known that, to carry on and be um, fine if a limb or two were, were um, lost. So the adaptive sports program, same with us, how oh, we love being on a sports team, right? You, you're part of a team, you, you have a lot of fun, um, it's healthy, you can talk to your teammates, you kind of understand each other. Um, so there were so many positive experiences that came from bringing these people together on the adaptive sports team. Um, again, their, their goal is to travel around Haiti, spreading hope and encouragement for all people with disabilities. Um, so we started off with an amputee soccer team and then expanded to a wheelchair basketball team for people who um, couldn't play soccer but, and were restricted to a wheelchair. And who knows where we'll go with this, right? Maybe they'll join the Paralympic Games at some point, representing Haiti. So here's some pictures of my um, first experience with Team Zarian. And then we have um, some videos that we're going to show. So this video uh, was taking my, uh, my first experience meeting the team, and I was just in awe of their ability and their um, camaraderie. Come on, guy. <laughs> What's neat is I see these guys every year. I go back, and now he's, he's this tall, and it's amazing. So that's, uh, this was my first experience with Team Zion. And then as the day went on, I was just more and more amazed. We'll get to the next video. There he goes again. So talk about balance training, huh? Should we do this in our therapy programs? So yeah, um, a lot of the sport that you've been um, doing today for Haiti and in the past few days, I think, um, will go to helping to support the um, Team Zarian amputee soccer team. So um, thank you so much for that. We're almost done with this video, sorry. I think we should stop there. Yeah. 
Thank you. So that first week, um, you know, I just kind of went uh, before I really knew what I was getting into. And it's amazing how one person, one article can really change your life. Um, but it really did. It gave me this idea, this concept. And here I go off to Haiti. And um, what I've learned um, in that first week was um, basically my whole perception of the world changed. And uh, I realized I had fallen in love with the Haitian people, um, their hope, and um, their, their dedication and uh, persistence for a better life was just incredible to me. And I admired everything that they had done to date and continue to do to improve their situations. I had a lot of guilt um, thinking about my own home. Um, that you know, I have everything, right? I have a home, I have a car, I have food in my pantry, I have a closet full of clothes, and you know, I just kind of thought, well, that's how it all is, right? And um, then you learn that your your vision of the world is different than it really is. And I really admired their determination for a better life. So then I became determined when I came back that I had to do something. So that's when I came back and I founded the Haiti Rehab Project, hoping to continue the relationship with them. And our mission is to um, support rehab and medical clinics, orphanage, orphanages, families, and outreach programs for those with special needs. So we started small. Uh, we collected shoes from our local school um, for the Team Zarian Amputee Soccer Team. And um, what's great about um, the situation that I'm in right now is we were able to send these shoes and then um, see them arrive in Haiti and get right to the people who we wanted them to get to. Sometimes when you are um, donating to an organization, you don't really know where it's going or what it's doing, or you're hoping, right, that it gets to where you want it to go. But um, this has been the best part, is to actually see that it gets right to the people that need it. So then I mentioned before, our, our nursing home, we were um, closing a unit, so we shipped some um, equipment, filled a 40-foot cargo container. We've done that two or three times now. Um, so then we went back and we brought a team of medical professionals. We worked again in um, Hospital Bernard Mev. And um, at this point, I really wanted to get out more into the community. And this is Frankie, and he was waiting for an orphanage because his family couldn't take care of him any longer. His family are alive. What they found in the orphanages is many times the children in the orphanages do have a parent. They just financially could not um, afford to feed them or take care of them. So this is some of the staff from Utica, New York. And we brought donations from a local home care company. And just again, to be able to pack it in our suitcases, bring it with us, and deliver it right where we knew it was needed was really nice. So then the next year when we went back, we were able to meet again with Team Zarian, and we were able to interview them, and that was probably the most meaningful um, day of my life. And just to hear their story, hear their stories, and give them um, a chance to say and be heard, um, say what they wanted. This is Joseph, he lost his arm in the earthquake. And the arm amputations with, ar people with arm amputations are the goalies in the soccer team. So um, the culture has the strong stigma against people with disabilities. Um, some believe they're cursed, um, believe that they're, um, they're no longer human. They're half man, half woman. This is Richard. He lost his sister, grandmother, his left leg, and his home in the earthquake. This young man was at a school when the earthquake hit. He and his best friend were pinned under the rubble for more than three days. While being extricated, he lost his limb, and his friend lost his life. Still has a sense of humor, though. So like I said, we were able to interview each and every one of them, and we asked them all the same questions. Um, so this is um, just a summary of some of the, the um, things that they told us. That um, what is the hardest part of being an amputee in Haiti? When I'm thirsty, I cannot carry the water from the well. Like I mentioned, it was the children's job to go get the water and bring it home for their parents and family. And so if, if he couldn't do that, that he really felt like he was um, unimportant in his family and he wasn't contributing. The tap tap bus won't pick me up because I'm disabled. No one will give me a job even though I can do it. 
I cannot help my mother with everything. What is the best part about being on Team Zarian? I feel alive again. I'm not alone. I'm with other people who understand me. I feel happy and proud to be part of Team Zarian. What are your hopes, dreams, and goals for the future? To have a job where I can support myself and my family. To go to school so I can get a job. To work so I can eat and find a place to live. To work so I can help my family. Not one of these people asked me for money, which I thought was um, amazing. They all wanted a job, which was just incredible. <laughs> so they put on a scribbage for us. So on this trip, we also went to some, um, I, I'm kind of um, going, trying to find out the, um, what's going on in the country a little bit. So I really wanted to get out there and see what was going on. So we did go to some orphanages, and this was on the way. So this is two years later, still um, intense in many communities. Um, this is Wilcia. I'm not going to read through. I think our time is going. But she was found on the street, and interesting, her wheelchair, huh? This is us using a table upside down, trying to help her to learn to stand. And again, the equipment is very minimal and poor repair, poor fit. So um, he fed himself for the first time that day. <laughs> um, so even while I was there, I was sort of operating as a PTOT speech. <laughs> Therapist, a little bit out of my element, but you know, you pick up, um, you know, a little bit, you know, more than other people know um, once you're in the healthcare field. And so we were working on um, even closing their mouth, learning how to close their mouth and um, facilitate a swallow um, in the orphanages. It was crazy. They would have all the children and they would just go around the room and, and shove the forks and you know because they were trying to take care of 40 children all at once and um, so all the children would just open their mouths not even attempt to try to feed themselves so um, we were trying to teach training feeding um, but they didn't have sip cups you know they didn't have many of the things that we take for granted so <laughs> he was trying to he wouldn't close his mouth because he kept smiling <laughs> And then it's uh, Food for the Poor Orphanages, 97 kids in this orphanage. So we train staff feeding and positioning techniques. The staff were loving, caring people. They just didn't have the education or resources. And you can see that her wheelchair is a sling stroller. So the uh, lessons learned from my second trip were in the needs of change since the first response. We don't want to impair the local Haitians from growing their own capacity. We want to look for opportunities for training and education um, because this will provide infrastructure and help them to support themselves in the future. So this was our, um, our mindset. And here is where we started the wheelchair basketball team. But December 2013, we opened our shop in Port-au-Prince. And this is where we um, started our teaching and training programs. And we, we selected eight um, of the members from Team Zarian. And we taught them how to use um, PVC to make canes and walkers, chairs and tables. And here's an example over here of a cane and a walker uh, made out of PVC, because they can get PVC in Haiti. So even teaching them how to turn a drill on and off was so interesting, right? And how to use a hammer and how to measure um, for the length. And this is Kato. He's got a spinal cord injury. And he um, has been trained in how to use a sewing machine. And so part of our teaching and training uh, program was that he is training another gentleman how to sew. And so we have some um, ties. And I think there's some out there um, made from um, Kato and Carrasco here in our shop. Yeah, that's some fun there. And some of the shirts are still out there, the Team Zarian shirts. So at the end of this, they were so grateful and um, very formal. They all stood in a line and they said, 
one of them was chosen to be the speaker, and he said, what you taught me today or this week was worth more than $50,000. You taught me a skill. For that, I am so grateful. And so, you know, that just really gets you right there. <laughs> um, so from there, we went to Gunaive's Haiti. This is 300,000 people um, north, a city of 300,000 people people that are, is north of Haiti, and this is where Sadu's hometown is. So he uh, really wanted to bring rehab services and in improve the health care in this area. So we went to the remote village of La Coupe. Um, there were no roads, so we took the bus as far as we could, and then we had to walk up or take the pickup truck th up into the mountains of Haiti. Here's some of the scenes. So this is getting a lot more rural in this area mud huts. We made a schoolhouse into a clinic and saw over 200 people this day. This was a medical clinic, so we had physicians, nurses, um, therapists, a pharmacy, um, and it just was amazing. So this little girl, um, she had knee deformities, and uh, we weren't able to do anything for her at this time. She really needed um, surgery, um, which really wasn't an option in Haiti. That's my son, Ryan. He's come um, on four of the trips with me so far. And he's a PT student in Utica right now. And this little boy, he had a fracture, and he had a string attached, like a sling. And you could see <laughs> where it was. Um, bent over. So um, we brought some of the equipment that we brought. We were able to put this donated splint on him, and luckily it crossed where the fracture was. So at least he was given some kind of a support for his fracture while it healed. This lady walked three miles to the clinic with a stick, and we were able to give her one of our walkers. Um, our first clinic um, day, we saw 120 kids um, just for um, medical screening to see if they were sick. And then the next day, we saw 500, um, well, across the three days, 500 people were served with these clinics. We were able to give out canes and walkers and uh, provide medical care to uh, many people who uh, may not see a doctor again for three months, may not be available. We continued our teaching and training. Here we're starting to make mat tables. So we're training in woodworking, measuring, cutting, um, support, lots of concepts. Looks kind of familiar, right? They look good. We brought them to um, Go Naives. We did some more medical clinics back up in the mountains. We've done some home visits. And what I was thrilled to see is that they're continuing to work in the shop after we leave. So not only did we teach them and they did it while we were there, they're continuing it. And how great is that, people with disabilities making assistive devices for other people with disabilities? So the next year, we opened our um, clinic in Gonaives, Haiti, because this was um, Sadu's mission and goal in life. And um, I was so happy to be part of that and be able to do that. So we uh, rented a space. We, were, we uh, raised money and purchased some of the equipment that we could in Haiti. Um, and here's the Center for Rehab, um, Rehabilitation Center of Archa Benit, Haiti. So this was very exciting. It was Sadu's 40th birthday, the day the clinic opened. Some of our first patients, a gentleman with paraplegia, just learning to walk again, this woman with a stroke, and again, stroke is very high. Um, the occurrence of stroke is very high because blood pressure isn't managed as well. This little girl had sickle cell disease, cerebral palsy, and um, we found that there's a huge need for our pediatric program. And these children before this had no access to care. Their families had no information, no education, no assistive devices, no way to um, help them. And this is our second rehabilitation tech technician that we've hired for our clinic. So in our first year, we saw 813 visits. Our diagnoses were stroke, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, fractures, arthritis orthopedic diagnosis, neck and back pain, 
uh, muscle strain. And so what the Haiti Rehab Project does is we, we do fundraising throughout the year to help pay for the rent, the electricity, supplies, and um, pay the salaries of the therapists. Because what we've found is even with a $5 fee for a visit, that that is out of the means of most people in Haiti. So some are able to pay that full amount, some pay half, and many we treat for free. So um, we're committed to providing these services for those people regardless of their ability to pay. Um, so that is really what the Haiti Rehab Pro Project does is we fundraise to support the salaries and the um, facility to run this clinic. We were thrilled to receive a Christopher Reeve Foundation grant um, we received $8,000, so for um, the next year, um, it was supposed to last for, for two years, but it's, we're, we're blowing right through it because the volume of visits keeps going up. Um, in our first community-based rehab, which is, so we have our hub, our clinic in Go Naives, and then now we're going out into rural areas. And our first day of this clinic up in the mountains, we um, saw 40, 43 patients on the first day and um, 313 patients in the first month. So we are blowing through that other grant real quick. Um, so this is what we found though with that community-based rehab is there's um, children with um, deformities, but um, due to their malnutrition, they are unable to have surgery. So if you look at this little girl, um, we're gonna see a video of her in just a second. And this was the same girl that four years earlier we had seen with just minor deformities, but her deformities have um, significantly increased. So she has, and she, we thought that she was gonna be able to have surgery, but they said because she was so malnourished we couldn't. So what we're finding is when we do these um, community-based rehab clinics, um, we're finding people in the rural areas, and my goal is to locate these people and then continue to check up on them and provide whatever care and services we can. So um, also with your fundraising that you've done with the coffee and the chocolate and um, everything else, that's gonna be continue to, um, thank you that's going to pay for their uh, continued serial casting and braces that they're gonna get within the next couple of years. Next couple of months, I'm sorry. Okay, so unfortunately they couldn't have surgery. We had to go to serial casting. Um, they think maybe he will not need surgery. We're not sure yet, but um, she will have probably six or eight serial casts over a period of six months. They will um, try bracing, and then um, if needed, they'll do surgery. This is another example that I just wanted to let you know that it seems like we're doing well when we, we find someone with a need and we uh, locate what they need and we um, just say, like this um, woman here, she's bilateral, she, for 20 years she's been like this in Haiti and so we just raised the $600 that she needed to have bilateral prosthetics made and so now we're making our $800 to get her her first prosthesis. So our partners in Haiti, um, so that's where we've gotten to date and just over the last couple of months we've escalated with increasing our community-based rehab program and what I'm finding is the need for uh, partnering with multiple um, not-for-profits in Haiti on the ground and also uh, partnering with people in, um, in the US that we can continue to expand and grow our programs. So we really wanna expand our interdisciplinary approach to care, our prosthetic and orthotic program, our community-based rehab services, continue that mobility and assistive device program. Um, there's a significant need for wound management programs, uh, coordination with local medical clinics. So the, the needs are um, therapy, nursing, dietary. It's all related, um, interrelated as we know healthcare is. And um, we of course wanna continue our adaptive sports programs and disability awareness. So um, part of the reason we're here today is hoping to um, spark some interest and see if there's a possibility that you will might wanna be involved um, with some, interdisciplinary partnership where we can really um, affect people directly in Haiti, even if it's across um, 
through the internet or through um, bringing people from Haiti here for additional education. We have a website and a Facebook page. And um, finally, uh, there's so much opportunity. So there's great need. We know that. Um, I have a direct relationship that I've built over the years with certain people in certain areas. And I really feel like we could make a huge impact. And um, obviously, where there's a great need, there's great opportunity. So from, from this point on, I would love to continue to build a relationship with you and um, see where we can take this. So I think we'll finish up with there. Thank you. That's right. OK, so the question was, as students, how can you help? Um, th there's a billion ways. So um, what we determined is it's wonderful if students can come and do a mission trip to Haiti and see for themselves, but that um, that's just a drop in the bucket. And uh, what we can, what we're hoping to do is build some kind of an education program where the students and local clinicians can help to train some of the people in Haiti on some of the skills that you're learning as well. And um, what I found is the internet is become is making. Um, being not right there uh, is not a barrier anymore. So um, what, what happens now is they will um, send me pictures and videos, or we can FaceTime, and they can um, say, I have this child. I'm not sure what to do with them. Um, and so we could build that kind of a relationship. Um, but, excuse me, fundraising is um, just, it's essential and crucial. So without funding, there's not a lot that we can do. Um, with equipment and things like that. There are certain supplies that we have to buy. Education, though, doesn't cost any money. So that, that's something we want to do. But also, so, you know, some fundraising definitely helps. And that um, um, what we want to do is be able to support the salaries of the rehab techs to continue the care that they're providing. So um, through your education, through fundraising, um, we can really continue and grow the programs in Haiti. Yes? Um, okay, so when, when I talked to one of our professors about opportunities to go to Haiti, they said that Duville will not, um, you know, represent that because of the dangers. Have you ever felt unsafe on any of your trips? I have, I have not had any negative experiences so far. I, um, she was asking if there was danger. Yeah, with safety. I have not experienced that, although other people definitely have. Um, I think it's improving. Um, I um, I use caution, of course. You know, just like when you go into any city or any back alley or whatever, you're going to be smart. You know, so um, I'm, I'm always thinking in my back of my mind. But I have um, really been. Um, lucky that I have had no issues whatsoever, but I know that's not always the case. Can I, add, can I just add to that as well? Um, the other issue for Duval is that it's an insurance liability problem as well. So it just happens to be that Haiti is a country that Duval doesn't, um, can't support for liability. I'm here. Sarah, I'm here. So I'm going to check with the insurance liability. You probably don't know me. I'm Larissa Patricia, I'm the Associate Vice President of Global Education here. So all of those faculty-led programs end up coming through my area. And uh, for the last, we did have a few mission trips that have gone out to Haiti in the past. And then there's been uh, some concerns with political, with the political mm -hmm. yes. climate. And then the insurance company says, one year, OK, you can take out this extra policy on it. And then some years, they say they're not covering it all. So when they're saying they're not going to cover it all, that's when we say, OK, we, we can't send it out. Yeah. But I made a note, again, to as I do the renewal with them every single year to check. So outside of Duville, are there opportunities, how you said we are looking for people to go on trips, are there anything in that organization that, you know, in the future? We do take um, interdisciplinary teams to Haiti. Um, they do get their own liability insurance and things like that. So I'm not sure if that is something that we, you know, maybe might be in a different avenue. Um, but we can we can find out more about that. Yeah. Yes. 
do you by any chance have your own uh, tax free? Yes. You are? Yes, yes. we're an official not for profit. We, we uh, filed, we, we have the 5013C. C3, I always flip that, C3 status. So any donations would be tax deductible. Uh, I know that you've spoken about uh, two specific individuals that you have in your rehab clinic right now. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you feel that there is a desire from those individuals and also individuals around you to come here? Do you really oh, yes. Absolutely. So the question was, do, um, like, I've identified a few uh, people that I, I know that, um, are currently working as rehab techs in prosthetics and orthotics, and um, there is a huge desire for them. They want to learn. They want anything they can do to enhance their education. They are absolutely looking forward to it. And they're trying to improve the education programs in Haiti, but it's just not completely there yet. Yes. So what would be the process to like, have them? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what would be the process to, to have them come here? Okay. Okay. Tasha, I'll pay you later. That was a great segue. Um, so the, the hope of the committee is that we, Ginger would identify individuals that would come to Duville. Certain criteria, obviously, they have to have a passport. They have to have English or else we're looking at interpret interpreters. Um, but we're looking for summer of 18, and these individuals would come under a grant or a scholarship, I guess it is, that Duval has recently put into place for these kinds of global education initiatives. So there's, there's availability of in-kind support so that individuals would have the housing or the meal plan or whatever it takes and then the education. So we would have alumni and faculty supervise students in all the seven healthcare um, fields to give some of the training. You seeing what you have here, you're training someone in the PT world, maybe you're training someone with assistive devices, how to measure for a cane, how to measure for the walker, what are you looking for with gait um, issues. Maybe in PA, you're concentrating in wound care. Um, documentation, Ginger was identifying that some of these individuals, they don't know how to do a plan of care, how to make progress measurable, how to document so that when the next person comes in and follows up with this person, they know exactly what was done and what are the next steps. So some of the basics that we take for granted, and you guys are walking out of here, you know, with this knowledge, they're struggling with it. So to bring them on campus, we feel that that impact would have a greater reach than to have, um, you know, somebody going there. Also going back to one of Ginger's slides about the respect for the culture and how is healthcare delivered, it would be, I feel, more valued if it's delivered by one of their own. So that when you train the Haitians to take care of their own people, that might be more effective than having um, others coming in. Um, my oldest son, did missions like this in Guatemala, mm -hmm. first as the director of an eye tech center and went down with doctors, mm -hmm. and then as uh, the head of the, a big orthopedic center up in Maine. And they were able, through several contacts, to get enormous amounts of discarded mm -hmm. new medical equipment from doctors who were refurbishing offices. Yes. And they were shipped yes. well in advance and kept locked up until the arrival of the group. And if you want to be in touch with him, yes. ask yeah. his um, yeah. sister. <laughs> Ginger, this is my dad. <laughs> I'll introduce you later. You guys can talk later. We need to field more questions. <laughs> Caleb, tell. No, no, because I think I saw Venosha's hand up. Uh, do we have a specific curriculum yeah. that you wanted to develop here? At, like, will we have a specific specific curriculum that we'll develop that we'll be working on recently for these people that are coming? Yes. <laughs> and again, the the thought is that 
the reason we have to put this out a year is the, the planning is going to be methodical. It's going, I was talking with um, Dr. Clemo earlier and she repeated it. We, we don't only want to be the first to do it, we want to do it the best way. And if we can set up a model that then other colleges and universities can follow, what a bonus that would be to have other colleges and universities that have multiple interdisciplinary programs within their college and university to say, this is Duval's plan for educating um, internationally. You just um, reminded me that on the World Health Organization, there's um, all this information about community-based rehab, and they have um, training um, things in there, modules in there, but the concept is to have a facilitator that trains the trainer. So it could be sort of the same idea where we bring certain people here with a curriculum, maybe they go back and teach the same curriculum to 10 more people, and it just expands from there. That has been a thorn in my side for, <laughs> the question was, is there funding for transportation? No, there's nothing. So for people in Haiti, you're talking about, right, with disabilities, yeah, not us, <laughs> to get there, right? Okay, so um, I actually just wrote a grant um, a month ago, thank you for bringing this up, to the Disability Funds Organization, Disability Rights Foundation um, out of Boston, and it was due March 16th, so I got it in March 15th. <laughs> and um, they've already been in contact with Messina and Sidhu, so I, I think, fingers crossed, um, we were we put in for um, to assist some transportation, and the whole premise of the grant was to um, facilitate. Um, access and transportation for people with disabilities in Haiti. At this point, there, there's, there's nothing. And so, um, was it you? Was it uh, maybe it was Pam that mentioned their son was carried in on a stre the stretcher was a door carried in. So um, I have an experience of a patient, um, a man in a stroke in a wheelchair in the back of a pickup truck because that was the only way to get him transported to the hospital. So um, the need is huge for accessible transportation for people with disabilities. It's just not, it's not there. Yeah, so the grant actually is um, for a bus for Team Zarian so that they can um, go around the country, um, different areas of the country, and have community awareness events where they um, will uh, perform, uh, you know, have a, a exhibition game that they play. They're gonna do education to the community. And um, this is part of the Convention of Rights of People with Disabilities. So the grant was to um, implement the convention. So um, this is how we wrote it up. And I know, like I said, they've been in contact with both of them already and they want them to open a bank account. So I'm hoping that they get the grant so that they can start with moving around the country, educating about the needs with people with disability. In addition to financial resources, what can local uh, Western New York businesses do to help provide um, for the mission I think um, I'm still receiving equipment donations or, you know, people if they're um, getting rid of um, items that they don't need, um, medications, but um, shipping, even uh, wound care supplies is huge. Um, so if any of the companies, um, maybe they get new products and they need to get rid of their old products or the problem is they can't be expired. They're, they're pretty strict about what can come in. And then the other problem is how are you going to get it there and get it to where you need it. So um, what we do is every time we go, everybody packs very lightly and we bring two additional um, suitcases uh, full of supplies and we then are able to bring them right to where we need to go. So that's one method. And then there's a couple different um, organizations that I've been working with that can sh ship larger supplies, um, like in a shipping container. But um, again, it's very difficult. It's tricky with the government, you know, that they pay high taxes when they get there. They sit in a warehouse for six months, you know. So it, it, is, it's, it is very difficult. And another thing that we're doing is, um, is buying more in Haiti, to promote business in Haiti. Um, so um, 
that's not as helpful because then you need funding <laughs> from from here to bring it. There, um, but but it does support the country to grow in their economy as well. What are your thoughts? Do you have any ideas of um, of how you might want to? Yes. So is the committee going to continue the, the one that, yes. that was started? Okay. And we're, and we're looking for committee members in the, you know, you're graduating, but as an alum, you keep in contact, you stay local, whatever, so the communication needs to continue the thread. But then the first year students who are interested step into the committee and so that it's perpetual, perpetuating, you know what I mean. Sustainable. <laughs> Yes? Um, I know you said that the rule of thumb already has training modules um, out there, but in the, since we know a bit more about specifically the people that the kids are through you, we could, I guess, perhaps put together like, the, the curriculum. The curriculum, yeah. Students, like, pull from our material and put them together. Like, how are we going to even put together like, videos mm -hmm. um, yeah. that we can send so we can start filming? Yeah. I mean, and the way the internet is, we could do, um, we could yeah, do, webinars. right? We could, webinars and. Even, even the videos would have to be internet dependent so that if someone had like, you can transfer files once they, once they had them, they had them. Right. Do Absolutely. Do all, all methods. Yeah. So what's the need? What, what, yeah. what their knowledge base is or what, where, what they're allowing to start? What about a um, Skyped pro bono clinic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sky's the limit. Right. Seriously, the, the internet, as Ginger said, the in, internet makes it not necessary to be right there and still have an impact. So yeah, this year that we have between when our students come, start building material, and space. And if you could build it so that first year students do this second year to do this, and then the next year it would rotate, so um, it would be sustainable and keep growing. And if initially we have the two, and as, a, as we said, then they may come back for more in-depth, more intensive. Um, you know, they sit in on, uh, if they've got the background in their anatomy and their ortho, then maybe they sit in on one of the elective courses in the advanced ortho course. You know, so there's all kinds of, of ways to promote the knowledge that it's overwhelming. For, to yeah. be honest with you, it's overwhelming. And, and Ginger and I kept saying <clears throat> the focus, but then you can't just focus on PT and OT. No. Because what about the dietetics and the nutrition that's involved in wound care? So, you know, the, everything builds on itself. So the focusing is going to be a challenge. It really is. So you had a you defined your purpose for today, but then then we have to define our purpose your purpose for the next and then build a plan. I just had a question yet about interest, and this is um, you know, I think far reaching beyond what we're talking about today. Um, as far as bringing people for a few weeks, I know that the college has already got some initiatives uh, for different areas of the world, uh, and I know that there's a lot of government uh, money that's available. Uh, in terms of grants, do you think that there's an interest of individuals um, in the long term wanting to possibly take on a scholarship role or something like that, if that's something that this could grow into, where they could actually come here for a long-term stay and get the actual degree mm -hmm. of physical therapy and then take that home with them and promote that in aid? I think the options are endless. <laughs> you know, we really could do, you know, we, it would have to be a person who could be here for four years or, or, or whatever number of years. Just with the microphone. I'm not sure how many of you are aware that Duville had sponsored um, three or four individuals from Tanzania. Where's, where's, is Larissa still here? And they received their education degree and then went home to Tanzania and built through grants and structured fundraising, um, I think a multi-million dollar school from ground up. And they are the faculty administrators of this school educating women and girls. And it's going to be, uh, what do you call it, dedicated in August of this year. And so that's 
where Duval has parked a little gem of a seed that grew out in Tanzania. So it's, it, but they got their degree. So if that's what you're talking about, Caleb, is yeah, we, give them the credentials, not just knowledge, but, and then the respect that they would deserve in their country. Anyone else? Um, in lots of different ways, we've had different things. So we've had Utica College students do some fundraising. Um, none, of, none of those students have come to Haiti yet. Um, we, I've had other students, PA students. Um, uh, my son is a physical therapy student, and we've had uh, just a wide variety of people coming, uh, miscellaneous kind of people coming. We, we had to bring people who knew woodworking. <laughs> um, that was actually my boss from 30, year, from 30 years ago that came. He's a physical therapist, so he had skills in woodworking, and he um, trained he trained with them. So students can be involved. Uh, professionals can be involved. I mean, really, it can be whatever we want it to be. Does that make sense? Whatever is appropriate. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Anybody else? Any other concepts you want to take up? Anyone else? Dad, do you have another question? So, mm -hmm. A lot of good ideas, and it sounds like there's many opportunities for further discussion to grow and see what we can do. But um, can you maybe prioritize this or something that you really think we can focus our attention on? So we all come come together. <laughs> well, right, right, right. So, um, well, it depends on, of course, I have my mission for re the rehab department, the rehab um, program, and the building the community based rehab. So, I'd really like to get that stable and, um, and funded. So, um, uh, a rehab visit is $5 a visit, so any fundraising that we can do to support um, paying the um, rehab techs to provide that service, because right now they don't have a salary unless we're um, supporting them. So that would be my first goal, is to help with that. But that's more PT, OT, um, speech-oriented right there. Um, but then uh, working with the multi-interdisciplinary teams for the mobile medical clinics, um, where we provide rehab services and, and follow together as an interdisciplinary team um, to facilitate that process. And then the teams are in um, amputee soccer team the, and wheelchair basketball team. We're just trying to um, continue to build awareness to all of the needs of people with disabilities throughout the country so that their lives can improve. So it is kind of all over the place. <laughs> I would say it's really um, up to the the departments, how they want to work individually, and then how how we want to make it interrelated as well. Yes? Um, as they, we spoke about um, getting people to come over here and take classes. Is there contact with um, the Asian government to possibly help fund this? We have not reached out to the Haitian government to see if there's any assistance there. Um, in the past, I know we've tried to get um, assistance from the government to help get visas for the amputee soccer team to be able to come over um, for different events, um, for training, for opportunities, and there really hasn't been the funding there. So I'm not sure that's a... Mm -hmm. yeah. If you've ever written a grant or asked for a scholarship of any degree, you have to be so specific with what is it you're asking for, and because right now we don't know what we're doing. This is all grassroots efforts, very, very tiny baby steps until we really get a good plan. And once that plan is in place, I think we can be approaching different organizations and agencies that have an interest. It has absolutely floored me the amount of support for Haiti that is in the western New York area. The more people I talk to, they'll say, well, do you know that so-and-so is married to a Haitian? And you know, it, there's, like, there's connections all over Western New York for this tiny little country. And so we, we can tap into some of, of those once we know what we're asking for. Uh, 
Okay, so you're asking um, what is the current process that we're using in the clinic to, when patients come in, like what's our procedure? So we're trying to set it up so it's similar to what we would do here in the US. They do an evaluation when the person comes in, they find out their social history, um, what kind of area they're living in, what kind of home they're living in, uh, what their resources are. Um, if they have any devices. Um, if we can make and give them a device, if it's ne necessary, we would do that. Um, we are putting, uh, seeing people two or three times per week if they, um, uh, transportation to the clinic is also different, um, difficult, so um, assessing all of those needs. Um, and they're putting on them on a rehab program and uh, facilitating, and, and the progress has been amazing. Um, so. They're, they're providing excellent care, but what I found is the, the actual goal writing and, and knowing what your um, appropriate goals are and um, d the impression, the, the documentation, right, uh, help, instead of just kind of winging it day by day, but having a plan that you're trying to move towards. So that, that was an education piece that I really identified, so I'd like to improve on that. Um, we have a lot of pediatric patients that are that we're finding that are in the area, and we're finding them with, you know, never having any access to care before. So I think the training in that in pediatrics is um, an area that will be hugely successful um, to create a big difference in Haiti. Um, did that answer your question? Kind of. Do you want to restate it? Can you focus more on like, the strength issues that they have versus range of motion issues from their deformities, or is it just a strictly, okay, this is what we have, we just want to get you functional, like you can do standard issues? Yeah, it, we focus on. Uh, we try to look look at the patient. Um, so there are the, the children there with the deformities, like we were talking about that them. But many people are uh, patients that have had strokes. Um, so we're going to look at the strengthening and range of motion and all that and work on that. So they work on impairments, um, but we're also trying to work on the functional training and improving their quality of life. And um, th like I said, the, ac the accessibility in Haiti is so poor. So being able to manage steps is um, hugely important and gait training and things like that. So we're, they're really doing all of that. Yes? I have some connections through family with healthcare organizations. Is there a way that um, we can connect them with you and um, the rehab projects? So Absolutely. Do do donations or even sure. Um, so uh, we have a website. And right on the website, it tells all about our work in Haiti. And then there's a donation page if it's a financial do donation. And then if there's um, equipment donation or things like that, they can send us a message through the website or um, the Facebook page. Or you know, my email information is right on the website, too. So any way they want to get in touch. So go ahead and like our Facebook page. And you can follow our progress so far of all the people that you've just met. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it's exciting.